This is the first recording of Pastor's Talk. It's a podcast hosted by my friend Les Newsom. I'm J.D. Shaw. Les is the pastor at Christ Presbyterian Church in Oxford. I'm the pastor of Grace Bible Church here in Oxford as well. And uh, the goal is for us to just take 25 or 30 minutes once a month and, and have a public conversation about things that have to do with the church. And I would include in that Christian living, spirituality. Um, so that's the aim of the podcast. Les, welcome. Yeah, very, very glad, glad you're here. here. Thank you for coming and being a part of this. It's always a delight. Uh, it's not just a, um, yeah, it's not just a great opportunity to think through and think together about God's word and how it applies to Christian living, but it's a chance for you guys to sort of get an insight into two friends who do the same thing in the same town with different congregations. Uh, and I think it's encouraging God's people to find out how much crossover there is and how much um, camaraderie and friendship feeds into a lot of what we do. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. And that's not always the case. So I'm very, Correct. very thankful for that. So we thought uh, what would be a good subject, good question to answer in the first podcast. And we thought, we've already got a question? Uh, yeah. Shoot, Rob. All right, we'll, we'll add that to the list. <laughs> we'll add that to the list. But today, cause sorry, I'd already come up with some, with some ideas. Uh, since it's pastor's talk, I thought we'd come up, we'd, I'd ask Les the question, what makes a good pastor? Yeah. And I, I have come up with, there's five areas of life, of a pastor's life I'd like to get your thoughts on. I think this is fairly comprehensive of what we have to do as a pastor. But I'm, I mean, this isn't obviously set in stone. It's just kind of my read on it. But I've got, uh, I, will, I won't list them all to begin with. But the first one, the big one, the one that jumps out in Scripture is, is character. So 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 talks about this. I won't read all of it, but just to give you a, a sampling of it. Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, and biblically that, that word refers to what we do as pastors, he desires a noble task. He must be above reproach, husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, and a few other things as well. So, Les, if you would, just talk about talk about the character traits there that are required in being a pastor and what jumps out at you? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> but it's the first one that's, that you stumble on, right? <laughs> um, we, we, for, the first reason I think it's an interesting question is because we're living in a time where, uh, statistically speaking, a pastor is moving down in terms of great respect from the popular crowd. Uh, and some of that is due to social media and we're highlighting things and whenever there's pastors that fail, that gets all the big headlines and so what's the real purpose? And so it's probably better to ask this question on the micro level, but every time I bring this up to even potential elders in our church, their first reaction is like, well, I, no way. <laughs> I couldn't be an elder because the character problem is a problem with me. Mm. Uh, and it's because they know their own souls. Um, and you like those guys. It's, it's funny, right? Which I think is actually the Bible's design. And I like that we can start off with this because it does give you a chance to sort of root pastoral ministry in the essentials of the gospel. Um, you, you, Jesus gets this, this great question um, um, from his disciples who are like, you know, we heard that there were these uh, people over where this tower fell on them and they, they, it killed them all. You know, who sinned, you know, in order to make that tower fall on them? And Jesus is very insistent when he's like, actually, um, don't worry about them. Unless you repent, uh, you know, you're going to perish also. And what I think Jesus is doing there is he's setting this precedent for what his message is going to be about, that it always has to begin in humility. And so the leadership that I see in our churches is, is always defined by a weird thing. Because you want to say, well, do you have the character to be an elder in this church? And if they say, oh, absolutely not, I don't think I do, you've probably just opened your door to the possibility of being one because you opened with the humility. Now, if there's a dead body in your trunk, right, we probably ought to talk about that. <laughs> and there may be some issues, and this is where Paul's getting specific in First Timothy 3, where he's talking about, you know, a person of good report, 
Uh, he's got to be well respected by the people in the community. Yes, there are parameters that God puts around character, but in general, if we're not leading with the humility of, yeah, if you think that you're really qualified to be a pastor, I've got some questions about whether you should be a pastor. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, I was really bummed out a few years ago when I saw that uh, two of the professions in the United States that are held in the lowest esteem now are attorneys and pastors, and attorneys <laughs> topped pastors. Oh, no. And I used to be an attorney, so I don't know what that says about me. But, uh, this isn't a character trait that Paul mentions specifically, though I, I would say it, it probably comes up in, um, under the qualification of not quarrelsome. Mm. But anybody that leads is going to have to learn how to take criticism. What, what, are some of the, what are some of the lessons you've learned over the years in ministry about the right way to respond to criticism? Because we're not, we are fallible people. We are certainly open to criticism. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the right ways to respond to criticism? And then what, what are some of the things that our people could do that might make it easier for us to respond to criticism? Yeah, knowing just how much the inertia uh, pulls a pastor to identify himself with the health of his church. <clears throat> what I mean by that is, is it's very easy when someone comes up to say, well, you know, JD, I'm just really struggling with what, you know, Grace Bible did for X, Y, and Z. Every pastor walks away from that and thinks that you didn't critique Grace Bible, you critiqued me right. when you said that. And I do think that God in his providence, at least this has been true for me, will oftentimes lead a pastor into, um, you know, great times of personal turmoil. Sometimes that's interior. Sometimes it's exterior. Sometimes it's breakdown. Sometimes it's pastoral care difficulties where he will work with the hopes of extracting that pastor's identity from the identity of the church mm -hmm. so that he can rejoin the church as a healthy person. Um, because, again, we want for our identity to be so rooted in Christ that that's where I'm drawing my excess off of. So that, so that whatever depletion, the work and the people are robbing of me, I've got a wellspring behind me of grace in Jesus that's actually feeding my ability to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I've always wondered that for the guys who went off the rails, they typically got the most defensive, uh, they got the most just eternally bugged, uh, and they open the door to cynicism, mm. and they start rolling their eyes about God's people. Um, and I've always thought that said more about their own souls than it did about whatever difficult situation they were called to pastor in. Um, because we're supposed to be the eternal optimists. And I don't mean we pastors, I mean Christians. We're the ones that look and say, well, the gospel rescues people in uh, the worst of situations, so why can't I be an agent of that? Good. Thank you. Cynicism, bad. How about that? <laughs> and it's so easy to fall into. All right, the next, next area I want to talk about, um, preaching and teaching. How much time do you, would you say you spend on the weeks you preach? How much time would you say you spend on a sermon? You know, it's a, it's a hard question. Yeah. I, everybody loves to ask that, um, and it varies and flexes. Are you pretty regimented, like you're going to spend Tuesday morning or Friday afternoon, or, or, or is it more spread out throughout no, the No, but I have to block off blocks of time. Like, I can't be... I can't like do sermon prep for like 45 minutes and then go switch to something else. Mm -hmm. For whatever we, for whatever, for me, it's a very different gear sermon prep and I kind of got to shut everything out and do it for like three hours straight. But it's probably about a day and a half of my time, maybe okay. a day. But now at age 56, you're recycling a lot of material that you had before and it, it doesn't always take that long. That would be a top a day and a half, I think, of, of how long it would take. Um, yeah, preaching and teaching in the pastoral ministry, I obviously spent a lot of time in my early ministry years with college students. I did campus ministry for 25 years before I became a pastor. And so you have a lot of conversations with students who are wondering about their sense of call. And one of the things that Paul mentions in that First Timothy 3 passage you read at the kickoff was able to teach, mm -hmm. which strikes me as interesting, which means that the Apostle Paul has a category that like some people got it and it's some people don't. That's right. And some people it's don't thing. have it. Right. You yeah. either have it or you don't. And I don't think it's quite as rare as people might think that it is, but there is simply an, an instinct that someone has 
to know how to hold the attention of people when they speak and address them and illustrate and present things to them. Um, and, and I want to follow up on that because I've yep. had a lot of, over the years I've had guys who wanted to be elders, ended up, a lot of them ended up becoming elders, but they said, J.D., I could never get up on Sunday morning and preach. And my response to them is, that's not the qualification. Right. It's, it's apt to teach. Just because you're not a, you don't think or you're not a good public speaker, that's not what, G, what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about on a one-on-one -on -one situation or maybe teaching a Sunday school class, people walk away saying, that guy helped me understand the Bible. That's right. But being able to hold somebody's attention for 40 minutes or 400 people for 40 minutes, that's yeah. not the qualification. Yeah. And, and in 1 Timothy 5, Paul, I think Paul has that distinction where he says that there are some elders that are worthy of a double honor, especially those who preach and teach. So there really is, that there's a uniqueness to that particular vocation. But yeah, but I've got to have, I've got to have the ability to have a conversation where I can unpack ideas, which means to some degree I can see the world through their eyes and help them see and help them process. So yeah, that's part of it. Now, I do make a distinction between preaching and teaching. Um, yeah. Uh, between those two. Um, you know, my father was a teacher. Um, I probably enjoy teaching a little bit more than preaching. And here's the way I distinguish those two. I, I do think that teaching... Preaching involves yelling and teaching... <laughs> right, <doesn't>. exactly. <laughs> exactly, right. Um, the screaming that goes on. Um, te teaching to me is explaining. Finding good ways to unpack, illustrate, explain, walk people through concepts. I see preaching more as an um, as exhortation. Yeah. This is urgent. You should hear this. You should respond to this. You should react to this. I, um, early on, I had very good mentors that were like, you know, you, you want people to walk away saying, what, what do you want me to do with what you've given me? Is there an urgency behind what you're saying? And I, again, I'll go back to our gospel-centered um, emphasis here. I really don't think it was until I had had my own kind of awakening in a grace-centered approach to ministry and, and the Bible and my own life in general <clears throat> um, that I felt like I had something to tell people. Mm -hmm. That to me is one of the biggest things to know whether you're a teacher or not is have you ever walked away from something from scripture or whatever and thought to yourself, uh, people ought to know that. That seems, impor <laughs> that seems important or that seems like good news. Um, in other words, the same thing that motivates a person to um, tell someone about this great TV show that we watched last night. Uh, ought to motivate the idea of one to get up and say, this is really, this is really great. Like, y'all ought to hear this. Wait till you hear that. That, to me, is where the urgency comes from, and that's when it becomes a sermon rather than a teaching time. Have you ever had to tell a guy, so in the, in the PCA, in our church, an elder is an elder. There is no distinction between different types of elders. In the PCA, there, there is a distinction between teaching elders and ruling, ruling elders. Teaching elders are ordained, and they're, they do this for a living, ruling elders or not. So if it, when it, and you, you've served on the ordination committee for Presbyterian. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. At least one time, I know. Mm -hmm. So when, have you ever had to sit a guy down and say, who wants to become a pastor, <laughs> a teaching elder, and say, I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't think you can do it on a Sunday morning week after week? Um, yeah, we better have. I have that conversation all the time. I will say this, though, and... I don't know how vulnerable we're going to get in this podcast or how much trouble oh, I, I get into. Where I'm going to be crying before the end of it. <laughs> not, not that kind of vulnerability. It's the kind of stuff that gets you in trouble if somebody else hears it. I can say it's almost never happened. We, we have 10,000 subscribers already. <laughs> that's so. right. On the floor of Presbytery, it never happens. And I think that's a bit of the weakness of our particular uh, uh, ecclesiastical system, that by the time a man makes it to that level, he's already been to seminary, he's already been examined. Yeah, it's the, too late. <laughs> the horse is out of the barn. That's exactly right. There's no way to stop the train at that point. But again, in campus ministry, it really was all the time conversation. And again, you try to frame it in such a way of saying, is this something that's really going to make you happy? Are you really going to take joy in this? And for the ones that you have the opportunity as a mentor to put in front of teaching opportunities, you just want to test their internal constitution. Like, is this working for you? Do you enjoy this? Now, it's got to be more than that. Um, I don't know how much you want to go into this, but I, I've gotten much more convinced over the years that when it comes to that sense of call for a pastor, when a pastor says, I feel called to do this, um, I lean much more on what we would refer to as the outward call than we would the inward call. Sure. Okay, what's the difference? The inward call, of course, is that, that sense of urgency that I've got to do this. I, I want to go 
and preach God's word and serve him in his kingdom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. An outward call is when a body of people led by elders that the Bible directs says, hey, we see gifts in you that we think would be useful and valuable for our congregation. Will you come and serve us? You see the difference? One is internal. It comes out of myself. The older that I get, I know a lot of people who are really convinced they have an internal call. Nobody wants them to come and be their pastor, though, <laughs> yeah. um, for a variety of reasons. And so I want to look and say, well, maybe you're not called. And that feels so personal to people who don't know the distinction that they trip up on it. So one of the reasons why I stayed in campus ministry for 25 years is you could, you could save people a lot of heartache, I think, by getting into something that once you've, you know, once you've gotten into it, you realize I'm just not, I'm, that's really not me. Um, there is some, and again, I don't want to get too lost in this, but I do think there's some give when it comes to pastoral ministry that like, you know, I can teach, I think I can get better. I'm, I'm giving that. I'm not trying to say that this is a binary linear It's not thing. only a gift. That's right. It can be it, developed. It, it can, can be developed. developed. Right. I mean, it's not, yeah. That's right. But for someone who can't get into the ballpark, it might be nice to look at them and say, yeah, don't head in that direction. Oh, I think it's a very loving thing to do. I think it's really hard to be the one to say it and <laughs> kill someone's dream or just you might be wrong too, you know, and that, that's why it's helpful to have a, to have an opportunity for them to test that external call. And so other people are saying, it's not just you saying, I don't think you got it, brother. It's, there's multiple people saying, I'm just not sure this is the way for yeah. you to go. Mentor programs and internships are more vital, I think, to ministry than they are in almost any other industry. Because uh, you can save God's people a lot of headache by warding off early on people's difficulties. I mean, I think it's maybe physicians <clears throat> are more important than pastors right. for that, but it would just barely if it is. Yep, yep, that's a good one. Third category of what makes a good pastor, I'm going to call, because these aren't biblical distinctions I'm putting out. This is just me thinking about what all I do. Um, pastoral shepherding. And I can remember, which is distinct from preaching and teaching, and there is I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before, maybe even said this about certain pastors you've had. He's a great preacher, but he's not a good pastor, or vice versa. He is such a great pastor, but, oh my goodness, he's not a really good preacher. Um, but you've, you've got to have both. So talk, talk about the, the pastoral shepherding gifts. Uh, you know, the, Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Mm -hmm. What is it, how... What does it look like in your mind to be a good pastor in that sense? I mean, preaching gifts are obviously under the biblical title of being a pastor. But you know, what I'm talking about here is that pastoral disposi disposition before pe uh, with people. What you might call for a doctor is bedside manner. Hmm. How important is the... Uh, where have you seen guys go wrong on the pastoral shepherding gifts? Yeah. Um, again, I, I kind of feel like pastoral care, um, I'm, I'm speaking off the cuff here. I may, re, I may retract what I'm We're about to say. We're all speaking off the cuff, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I kind of feel like the pastoral care thing is a little bit easier to teach and learn than even sometimes the teaching preaching thing can be, and here's why I'm saying that. Um, I lean a lot for definitions uh, when it comes to care in the body on um, a, a definition that I got from uh, Brene Brown uh, Brene Brown's kind of a popularizing uh, YouTuber. Uh, she's done a lot of work in the area of shame um, and um, leadership and taking courage in life <clears throat> and about vulnerability as well. Um, I really appreciate a lot of what she's doing. And one of the things that Brene Brown does is she defines what it means to connect. Now, she begins that whole conversation about connection of saying we're wired for connection as human beings. I think that's her way of talking about us being created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of our desire to be in God's image is to be connected to one another meaningfully, of which marriage and family are these sort of radiating centers, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but here's how she defines connecting. Connecting is the ability to see and communicate that you can see the world through the other person's eyes. That's a fantastic definition to me of the empathy that it takes to do pastoral care well. How can I enter in, <clears throat> grow at being a better listener, which is not easy when you go to seminary, by the way, because they give you tons of stuff, and it's very tempting very early on, and I still struggle with this, it's not a thing, 
Someone will say something and you get like a little line and you're like, I know a mini sermon on that. Let me walk you through this. And suddenly you've talked for 15 minutes and the person just kind of melting into their, their uh, hand. Um, but connecting means listening long enough to actually hear the person, finding that skill set of giving back to them what, what you think they're saying. Um, more times than not, that skill of connecting, I found people walk away and say, that person, they understood me. That was insightful. When really, I'm not sure I said that much, they just felt cared for. Now, having said that, you also have to have with that an apparatus of making sure that part of just the business of being a church is learning how to take care of one another. So, yeah, we do need to have a list of who's in the hospital. Because <laughs> I want somebody to come see me when I'm in the hospital, and we just don't want to miss that. So, who's going to go see JD when he got his knee surgery or whatever? Um, that to me is both of the, for the pastor, there's got to be something inside that's leading me to connection and empathy and just love, love for God's people. Um, but on the other hand, learning the skill set of building systems that can help people make sure that they don't get lost in them. And show. we'll talk about that more with the fourth category. But yeah. before we go there, you had an interesting road to becoming the lead pastor of a church because you were in ministry for how long? 20 25 years before. Yeah. 25 years as a college minister before, and was it 2018, summer of 2018, mm -hmm. you became the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church? Mm -hmm. All right, was there a shock to your system in making that transition from being, uh, from counseling and pastoring, in a sense, college students only, to now having to pastor people of all ages? Was it, was it kind of like, College students always sang your praises and thought you were awesome, and now you're pastoring people who have opinions, and <laughs> right. they might think That's you right. do it differently. I mean, was there yeah. any of that, or was it, was it pretty seamless? No. I mean, there's no question that, like, uh, and J.D. and I have laughed about this before. I'm sure that's why I asked the question, is, like, there's really nothing like college students to make you feel like you're the greatest pastor in the world. <laughs> that was amazing. Like, can we meet this week and talk through those spiritual issues? Um, Sure, you know, and it, it really feeds a lot in you. Um, yet that goes away like brilliantly uh, as a pastor. That's been, that's been a great desert of that. And Not I was, with anybody in the room, though. Nobody. <laughs> that's in right. room. All these people are great. Yeah. No, um, but but I don't want to make it sound like there's not encouragers. There are. Sure, sure. It's just a different kind of vibe when you're there with peers and especially peers that know you. I try to or tell people, people a quarter of a century older than you. That too. Yeah. That as well. Although, yeah. At age 56, you just you start to understand that group a little bit, <laughs> a little bit better. Sure, I, you're I, a I'm lot more empathetic. Than I'm you having a whole lot more fun with my old people than my college yeah. students at age 56, but that's a whole different story. Um, All of a sudden, they got smarter. Is that what's going on? <laughs> that's it. But but I think that like you know when 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 the empathy of connecting with people, I do think has to be sort of ingrained in you that you have to get excited about hearing someone's stories. And I do think that there's a tragedy in pastoring that the business of the church can get to be so overwhelming that you miss what you love the most, which is like, man, how do I draw you out? You're just, I just want to hear your story. I'm not looking for theological inaccuracies in what you say. I'm not looking to sort of preach a sermon or sort of do it. I just want to hear, how, where are God's fingerprints on your life? That Somewhere in that has got to sort of drive all of our pastoring. And I find it's something I've got to fight. I've got to fight yeah. against things because I can fill up my time with lots of busy work uh, in the office, um, but it's the people over coffee that I like the most. I know you do as well. Yeah. Fourth category is administration. First Corinthians twelve twenty eight talks about the spiritual gift of administration, and you wouldn't at first. That doesn't sound super spiritual. It doesn't at first sound like something <laughs> that's all that important. But once you once you get more than 12 people in the room, all of a sudden being able to administrate is really an effective way to love people. If you don't administrate well, you're going to drop the ball and you're going to hurt people, hmm. quite frankly. Hmm. So what does it look like for you? What, what, is it, what are some of the keys to administrating? I mean, I'd say Christ Presbyterian Church is a... It's not a mega church, but it's certainly not a small church. I would say it's a medium large church. Does that sound sure, right? Sure, it's, sure, sure. Yeah. It's not it's not XXL, but it's not it's not just medium either. Yeah. So what does it look like in your context 
as the lead pastor to administrate well to make sure just stuff is getting done because mm -hmm. people are going to be disappointed and hurt if stuff doesn't get done. Yeah. Okay, so I would not quote this if I had not heard it from Tim Keller himself. Okay, so there's a name drop for Who's the podcast he? right there. <laughs> Just um, we were having this conversation a couple of years ago. His son is in my pastor's cohort. And Keller drew a distinction that I think I've shared with you before that I'm not sure. I've never heard it from anybody else and I thought it was fascinating. There are actually two words in the New Testament that are translated because they're different words in different ways. But the first, whenever you see the word um, elder translated in the New Testament, that's the word presbyteros, from which we get the word presbytery. Pre Presbyterian just means elder-led. That's all it means. But there's another word, episkopos, from which we get the word episcopal, which is usually translated bishop. Now, I'm not going to do a Bible study, but we believe in our denomination that those two offices of bishop and elder are the same office. Uh, in Titus 1, I think Paul is pretty explicit that he's talking about the same office with those two. But Keller mentioned that he felt like those are two aspects of what it means to be a pastor. He says, your elder is your spiritual insight person. Can I pray with you? Let's talk through the gospel. Um, what's going on with you? That kind of thing. The bishop, though, is the one who knows how to run a business. Mm -hmm. And he says, you typically can kind of grade your average elder or teaching elder on one of those two levels. But typically in the church... We, we emphasize the former to the exclusion of the latter in my experience. Oh, yeah. So that you got a lot of pastors that are like, well, I'm not very good at administration. Um, and it always drove me crazy um, um, just because I'm kind of wired that way. If, if, I always think, like, so here's, your, here's your elder sort of balance. Here's your bishop balance. You know, I'm probably a little more bishop than I am elder. I don't mean that I'm trying to run things. I just, I like for things, I like for the trains to run on time. Amen. And I might make sure that happens and hurt somebody's feelings in the process. <laughs> so, so I'm not a great elder. Maybe I'm a better bishop. I don't know. I don't know if that distinction really carries. But yeah, this, this is part of the burden, I think, of not just dealing with, with more than 12 people, but what happens when those 12 people turn into 50 people? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of a different show. Well, now what happens when that's 150 people? Um, I was talking with a friend of mine who took over, this is literally two weeks ago. This is fresh content. Um, who seven and a half years ago took over a church that had 500 people in it when he got there. And they just crossed over this last year, 1,500 people. Now, this guy is really gifted. There's a lot of circumstances that led to the growth of this church. And he's very humble. He goes, it's not me. And I kind of agree with him. Just kidding. Um, but um, it's a huge growth in the church. And he says, about every other month, I'll have someone come to me and just like, oh, this is just not really like the church that it was 10 years ago. And I just miss, miss what that was like in the old days. And he, and he gave the best response I've ever heard. He said, you know what, that's interesting? Because it's actually not the church that I was called to pastor seven years ago either. Yeah. So you're like, what does that take? But I have felt like as a church is growing or not, that is the administrative burden. How do you basically scale ministry? Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, a pastor can know everybody when there's 50 to 100 people there. But you get to like 200, 300, and it's like... <sighs> And then elders get panicky. We don't know who's here. I, I, I walk into church. I don't know who everybody is. And you're like, well, yeah, yeah. But we got to create some kinds of ways administratively. It's hard to do that. It's very hard to do. Yeah. So, I, uh, Along the lines of presbyteros, episcopos, I've always heard prophet, priest, and king. Yep. The prophet is the characteristic of the pastor who's good at preaching and you know, rallying people with their oratorical gifts. You've got the priest, he's going to come and hold your hand and say they're there. And then you've got the king, who's going to get stuff done organizationally. Yeah. Not biblical, totally but helpful. Valid. Yeah, totally valid. Last question. Mm -hmm. The fifth category I have about what, it makes, what makes a good pastor is one that I just ran from as long as I possibly could. Still don't like it, but I, I call it the vision thing, mm. which is, all right, you have this reality. You have the church, which is the body of Christ, but then you have this 501c3 tax-exempt <laughs> organization that's called Grace Bible Church. And you ignore that reality to your peril. Mm. You, you've got to make sure this organization is going in a certain direction. Everybody knows where you're going, why you're going that way. Things like payroll and tax-exempt uh, forms are being insurance. Mm. We just did a renovation. Y'all did a building project. All kind of vision things involved in that. Mm. Um, 
My, what I, I, I heard, I'll, I'll get to a question, I promise, eventually, <laughs> Les, but um, years ago I heard a pastor say, all of that stuff is dead, okay? There's no spiritual life in the Constitution and bylaws of Grace Bible Church. Mm. Nothing spiritual about it. He said, it's like the bark on a tree. It's dead. But if you don't have any bark on a tree, guess what happens to the tree? It gets really sick. It, it dies. dies. <laughs> so you've got to pay attention to that, that stuff, the, the vision casting, uh, those details. What are some lessons you've learned in the six years you've been a pastor in a very, in a growing church, not growing as much as your friends, but still growing mm. very rapidly. Mm. What, what lessons have you learned about what I'd call the vision thing? Yeah, I, I found that when, and it was, I, I cheated a little bit because um, I was a member of Christ Christian Church for, what, 18 years before I became its pastor. So I had a, I had a, I had a, an, a certain eye view on the life and growth of that church that would have been much different for a guy who came in from out of town, I think. But I did find early on that it was important to help a church see who they were and to quantify it and then name it. Mm. Um, to me, that's what the vision casting is part of. It's like, it's like helping a congregation be like, let's get from a 30,000 foot view. Because you and I talk to pastors and churches way more than your average person in the pew does. We've seen more. We, we, we've, we've, it's on our minds all the time. We think we don't about expect it all the time. to be on anybody else's mind all that's the That's exactly right. So part of it is simply, and I hate the fact that this is a negative term, but it's kind of a branding thing. If you take the, if you take the term branding from marketing in its best sense, all that's doing is helping people unify, clarify, and name vision. Um, and so we tried to adopt some simplified language. We had great mission statements, but they were like four pages long. And you're like, okay, that's great. This is all Bible stuff, but can we package it in a way that sort of quantifies where we want to be so that people can be like, okay, that's a thing for me to hang my hat on and for us to sort of organize uh, mission around. Um, so we, we, we talk, we say it every Sunday, we're here to proclaim a hope, to build a home, and to launch a healing, both in ourselves and the world around us. That's our hope, home, healing corresponds to gospel, grace, proclamation, um, uh, enjoying and engaging in the life of the church, secondly, and then advancing God's kingdom through care. It'd have been really funny if you couldn't have remembered it. Just <laughs> that's right. I better remember it because I was the one who led the way on it. But here's the deal. The thing that's the challenge of, of vision is realizing just how quickly things change. Yeah. And how do you take that vision and adapt it to go forward? You're going to have to talk to better pastors to get that insight because it's hard. Thank you so much for coming to Grace Bible Church. Thank you for having for me. For this first episode of Pastor's Talk. And we're going to do it again, Lord willing, the third Thursday of September. I don't know off the top of my head what date that is, but at Christ Presbyterian Church. So, so stay tuned. Thank you, Les. Tell your friends. Make sure you like the podcast. And, 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 and subscribe. It, and, and subscribe. I've heard that's done. <laughs> that's right. So, yeah, thanks for the time, baby.